Hi, I'm Kudo Mal, Branch Chief of Kudo Wales in the UK. I'm on a mission to raise awareness for Kudo and the benefits of being a martial artist. Kudo is a full contact mixed martial arts and combat sport developed by Grandmaster Azuma Takashi. In my opinion, Kudo is the perfect way for martial arts to pressure test the efficiency and their technique as well as their fighting ability as it's the closest thing you're going to get to a real fight. Today on Fighting Talk we have Hanshi Mark House, IBK 8th Dan. Mark is the special advisor to the president of the Kyokushin Budokai All Round Fighting Section and is internationally recognised for his pragmatic approach to karate. Mark is one of the first MMA teachers in Scotland. During his time in the martial arts, he met Kaicho John Blumen. He found the system that he'd been looking for. He's been a direct student of Kaicho ever since then. Let's meet Mark. Welcome to Fighting Talk, Mark. Mark Howes up in uh, Scotland. Um, obviously, I've had the pleasure of meeting you in, in the last year, and um, I'm not going to go into too much of that, but I've, I've much respect for you. And, uh, you know, you supported the channel earlier on with you know, the two minute tips and uh, that, that went off. And I thought that was brilliant because you said it as it was. Even some of the students that I've got um, in my group just thought they watched that over and over again. It's the most quotable two minutes, I think, that we've had on it. So it's brilliant. Is this where I have the rant? <laughs> it was brilliant. It was so, so good. So, yeah, um, I rant a lot. I rant a lot. <laughs> just, just for people who may not know you or, you know, obviously getting uh, your name out there. What's been your uh, martial journey to this point? And, you know, what's your current place? What's your current role? Okay, so um, I think the, the like with a lot of people, there's a prime mover that pushes you into a kind of combat sport for a lot of people. And for myself, it was, um, my father was very abusive, very physically abusive, abusive with myself and my mother, you know, well, mainly with me when I used to try and interfere with him, like knocking my mum about for stuff like this. So. When I, um, uh, when I went to, to um, secondary school, there was a, a man there called Alan Owen, who I'm still, he's in his 80s, I'm still really good friends with. And during the 60s, he trained with Anoida. He did uh, Shotokan Karate, he trained with Anoida. And he's one of the few guys I knew that had martial, proper martial art books, which you've got to remember, there was no Amazon back in those days. You had to go to like WH Smith's and you had to order, they had to go and they had a microfiche film it's like something out of Mission Impossible. You know, flip through, find the book, find the number, order it, and then say, we'll send you a postcard when it comes in. Yeah. You know, And then you would go down and buy it. It was really difficult. So I got to see these books. And then in 1973, uh, a Wadaroo club run by Kevin Hamilton Stewart started up in Pembroke. And it was pretty cool because it was in the old drill hall where they did the old drilling for First World War. So it was right in the shadow of Pembroke Castle. Right. So when you came out, there was Pembroke Castle, literally right in front of you from there. So it's really, it's, looking at it now, it's quite romantic. At the time, it wasn't because people used to nip down the alleyway and go for a piss straight out of the pub. So in the summer, <laughs> it hummed. He'd go, it's like ammonia. <laughs> you make a dash for the front door. Yeah, it was like it really, it really smelled. So um, I started off training with, uh, in Wideroo. Uh, um the club later split, and I wasn't very happy with the way it split, but by that time I moved to Bristol. Um, and at that point, it was like a smorgasbord of martial arts. I was really lucky. Um, I trained with the Laogar boys before they're really, um, like now we have Lloyd Allen and the guys, I think it's a death squad they call it. Yeah, yeah, the Bristol, I think yeah, they yeah. trained out of the Inkworks. I think it was Jamaica Street or something, but they trained out of the Inkworks. I remember that. Yeah. And I had my first real lesson in how ineffective my martial arts were. Yeah. Okay. So I trained with Meiji Suzuki and Tatsu and Toyota Kamazawa, you know, doing all this kind of, oh, you do this right and it'll stop a, a charging rhino, rhino, you know? <laughs> so I've been doing some stuff with it. And Winston Greenwood, as he was British and European kickboxing champion when it was really new back in them days. It was really, really new. And he'd said to me, do you want to have a try? So I was like, oh, of course. He obviously has no idea of my prowess as a martial artist <laughs> whatsoever. Oh, I pity the chap. I shall take it easy. <laughs> Literally speedballed me, you know? <laughs> and at one point, he took his glove off and ate a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what 
is that? Is that cheese and pickle? Yeah, yeah, you want some? <laughs> I mean, decimated me to the point when I came out of it and I thought, I really need to reevaluate what I'm doing. I really need to have a look at it. I was dipping in, I was training at the Kyokushin there at the time. There was a Kyokushin yeah. club there. There was various different karate clubs. And as kind of fate stepped in, I got offered a chance to work up at the what was then the new, just being built, Salon Vaux up in Shetland, which was the biggest um, oil refinery being built in Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. So when I moved up there, I was working up there and in Lerwick, which is the capital of, uh, of Shetland, they had a shot Shotokan club. So I started going to the Shotokan club, but they did no sparring. Mm -hmm. They only did mainly kata, a little bit of sparring. Mm -hmm. But some of the kind of young bucks there were really keen to do some sparring. And as it was in a school hall, it shut over the summer holes. You know, yeah, so yeah. they said, if we find the hall, can we keep sparring? And I, will you take us for sparring? I said, yeah, of course. And then we actually ended up breaking away. And the right. club, the Shetland Budokai, is I think about 34, 35 years old. And it's still running to this really? day. Wow. A guy called Neil Pottinger is running it. And it's still running to this day up in Shetland. They still run. Well, they Neil. have their own thing. <laughs> they, 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 they do their own kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, at that time, we started, uh, we were bringing in full contact karate. We had head guards on and we were working the full contact karate. Yeah. And then when we moved um, in 82, I decided to go for my showdown. And I did my showdown down in Leicester. And uh, part of the grading panel there was a guy called Jerry Bryan, who was doing, who did knockdown karate. So I did some knockdown for the first time, which was a bit of an eye opener because nobody yeah. told me you kick legs. Right, you know, yeah, right. A bit of an leg opener. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, literally. <laughs> Why are you walking so funny? It was like I really got smashed up in my legs. I met a great bunch of guys uh, and ended up joining his organization. Right. You know, um, things happened. It doesn't really matter why. I'm not, I don't slide people off online, you know, to yeah. me, but things happen, you know. Um, but at this point um, in 1990, a friend of mine called Ross Frame had uh, been speaking to me about Ashihara Karate, and I got a copy of the Fighting Karate book. Yeah. Uh, I think it was 1990 I got it, you know? Yeah. I looked through it, and I found there's a guy called Peter Rippin down in London who was doing, the only person doing Ashihara Karate. So I went down and trained with him. It cost me thousands flying backwards and forwards. Yeah. Then in 91, I went to Wiedebeck in Denmark, and I trained with Dave Jonkers, uh, David Cook, all these guys that, that are now like kind of household names. I was training with these guys. Uh, and in 92, I got offered to do, I was already a sand dan. I got offered to do my third dan again. But I was so in awe of the system and the guys that did it who were incredible, that like the, the, the Danes and the Swedes were just unbelievably good tacticians. Yeah. I just thought, I can't do a third dan. I, I, I just, I, I can't because I don't think I'm ready for it yet. So I did a, a knee down and a, and a 40 man fight in 92 and a sand down and a 50 man fight in 93. Right. Eventually I ended up getting my, um, awarded my fourth down in Ashihara Karate. During that period, I met uh, John Bloomy. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> so, that's the how, right. so that is a, a very potted, broad stroke history of yeah. where I've got to at this point. And at that particular point, um, I was working with David Cook developing his Zushin Gen system. Right. And um, uh, we had a, a bit of a falling out. Okay. Over my relationship with uh, Kaicho, uh, John Blooming. Right. And, okay. and um, so we kind of went our separate ways. And John Blooming said to me, would you like to come with me? And I was okay. like, yeah, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I, so at that particular point, I started training full-time and I was one of John's students, direct students from that point on. Right, okay. Your title is Hanshi, is yes. that? Yes. Yeah. Hachi Dan, I made Dan. Hanshi Dan, yeah. So, that yeah. and so the, the thing what I've seen online recently is a lot where, um, you know, maybe the, the term is not correct for the title or, you know, like um, I was talking to Todd about the term Senpai, for instance, and, and, and it just... Up. You know, just being that had to be, and everybody's got this mindset of it just being first down, you know, and things like that. So it's kind of how, how do you feel about like sort of having that title? Is it so you know, if you if you've got someone in the class that you have to address you by Hanshi in the class or outside of the class, or 
you know, what happens? Only, only inside the class. Most people, um, a lot of my students address me as Hanshi outside, but it's more as a term of endearment. Right, okay. It's not done in any kind of, oh, oh. they'll okay. just, if I'm out, they'll just go, Hanshi, you want a burger? You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it just, that's how it gets. Well, even my wife does it to me sometimes. She wants me to do something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, when I was awarded my eighth stand and the title of, of Hanchi by yeah. John Rooney, yeah. um, I, 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 can, I can see where Todd is coming from because Todd yeah. has a lot more. Uh, he lives in Japan. He speaks Japanese. He writes Japanese. He's an mm. extraordinary individual. He's an extraordinary yeah. individual. And I can see. But language appropriation is going on all us around us. You yeah. hear the word phobic used a lot. Now, the actual clinical term of phobic means um, if I'm arachnophobic, it means if somebody, if I see a spider in the room, I'm liable to have heart palpitations, collapse, I'm unable to speak properly, my behavior becomes completely erratic, and it becomes literally fight or fr uh, uh, flight uh, situation. But there's been an appropriation of that word yeah. by people to say, to, to strongly put a spin on something. Yeah. You know, you are phobic, as in, you know, and this adds emphasis to the word. So yeah. language moves and yeah. changes through time. Sure. You know, it, it really does, it changes. I'll give you a classic example. When I was at school, um, that's a true story, right? But when I was at school, <laughs> well, you tell false ones, do you? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do tell false ones. No. Um, but when I was at school, I was making a chess table for my mum, and I was rubbish at woodwork and I mean like rubbish at woodwork and I couldn't get it to sit properly okay so yeah. I every time I cut a leg off it got worse right yeah. so this thing was shrinking by the, by the half hour so eventually I had to take it to my woodwork teacher who yeah. sat there with his brown jacket on and he looked at it like this and, his, and this, is what, this is what I mean about how language changes if somebody said this today then people will go absolutely mental over it you know what i mean yeah. he looked at the table he looked at me and he says what are you house some kind of spastic <laughs> oh god blame me right? to which i yeah see your reaction shows yeah. how far we've come forward yeah because obviously that's okay. not a word you use anymore right? no my reaction <laughs> at the time was sir yeah, right? yeah. and as i'm going back i'm getting all these uh you know, oh, it's you know as i'm yeah. going back but i knew all i had to do was wait until somebody else screwed it up, screwed up in the class, yeah. and they got called something, and I would be clear of it. So, yeah, right. so language changes, sure. terminology changes, things that had very little meaning apart from ribbing you, really, have yeah. now become something that are terrible to say to something. And rightly sure. so, they're a terrible thing to say to someone. Sure. Hanshi is a term that we use, particularly in the, the Western. Um, karate more. I, I think they tend to use shihan a little bit more in the yeah. Japanese, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just oh, a term to be appropriated. Yes, I think it's just a term that we kind of have used. So there well, was a time. I, I guess what I was doing was I was leading in into the 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 second question I was going to ask you, and, I, and I've and I've wrote them down to you because it's like normally I, I have a good idea, but I've got them down uh, to make sure that I cover everything. But it was more to do with. And um, the titles could becoming something for other people rather than something you portray or put on someone else. And in your book, because you just recently wrote a book, and I felt really lucky and uh, honoured, to be honest, uh, to be one of the first to, to read it. And I'm not embarrassed to say, and I've told you about the, the kind of undiagnosed dyslexia. So if someone puts a book in front of me, I know I've got a mission um, and I've got to dedicate a lot of time to it. So, but I, you know, I even come across an app to be able to read it to me this time around as well. So um, it was, it was a, a, probably the highlight, to be honest, the, of of everything that's gone on this year because it was at the right time. And I think that one of the parts that you wrote in there was about about this language, about respect. And some people put um, the title to say, "You must call me." It's my little one. <laughs> you must <laughs> you must call me sensei, or you must call me you know, Xi'an or whatever, it's something that's put on the students so you're demanding respect rather than actually getting the title via respect. So, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have uh, any issue at all of calling you Hanshi at all because, you know, even if it was not to do with um, the style, it's because the amount of respect that you got, I've got for your uh, time in the martial arts and it's evidence. I mean, the short amount of time that I've 
I've spent in your dojo there, <laughs> seeing you, uh, you know, get causing Kieran a, a load of pain, which I, we still laugh about. Um, is so, what what kind of made you write the book? You know, I mean, and what were you trying to achieve by writing the book? This actually does tie in with the title statement. You actually segued actually pretty perfectly. Yeah. You know, um, one of the one of the kind of um, antecedent points was in this was. Um, I was in, I think it was, I think it was Switzerland I was teaching it. It was a tre tremendous course, put on, the guy who put it on did an amazing job. Um, um, but there was a lot of these fourth and fifth dans who were somewhat portly. Right. If you understand what I mean. Yeah. They'd let yeah. themselves go. They yeah. did very little apart from walk around and they have their belts out with clearly designated stripes on. So yeah. the karate is one of these systems. It works on visual cues. Yeah. So you work on colors. So you can tell where you are in the hierarchy, theoretically, by the color of the belt. Right. Then when you get to black belt, it used to be that a black belt was enough. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, the bands started coming in. So you had yeah. bands coming in like sergeant stripes. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. Coming yeah. in. Anyway. Yeah. When in the Goshen system that I run here, you see the kanji behind me, courtesy yeah. of Todd. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. Um, there are no bands. You just have a plain black belt yeah. because it's more about what you know and what you can pass on than what you can actually have. So when I was at this place, one of the guys had said, um, oh, that's bad Buddha. And uh, I stood for a while and then later on he says, oh, that's, that's just not good Buddha. So I turned to him and I said, what do you mean by Buddha? And he looked at me like a dog that had been shown a card trick. <laughs> he had no idea how to answer. I says, what do you mean by Buddha? And he vaguely mumbled something about the samurai or something like this, and how your actions are and, and how you should be. And I says, no, I don't understand. I said, I'd like you to inform me. I says, because what you've just said, he, he said something he said. I says, that's stoicism. That's not Buddha or Bushido. It's stoicism, what you just said. Yeah. I said, so I need you to understand what you mean by Buddha. So I did a kind of informal thing, wandering around, just gently asking people in a non-confrontational way what they meant by Buddha and stuff like this. And I was quite appalled about how many senior black belts really didn't have a clue apart from its mouth value. Yeah. Bad Buddha, good Buddha. Bad dog, good dog. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's really kind of exactly the same, same kind of idea. Mm. When I'd been um, looking, um, I'd, I'd written a, a small kind of uh, pamphlet kind of thing for my club about um, the, the seven virtues of Buddha. Yeah. And uh, Eric, uh, Kancho Eric Vanberg was aware of this. And he said to me, um, uh, could you expand this for the IBK? So we can actually have more than just, say there were just a sports system and a Goshen system and this, we also have like a kind of philosophy thing. So I, 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 I took the task on, I didn't, I genuinely didn't mind it. And then, but I did it from my own unique angle. And like yourself, much of my life I've spent working in particularly with young people with social, emotional and behavioral problems. Yeah. And I've seen their backgrounds, I've seen their files, I've seen where they come from. And pretty much all of them didn't have a way, with a capital W, they didn't have a way. Their way was getting drunk or taking drugs. They didn't have any positive role models. It would be as, as I wrote in the in the in the in the manual, as I wrote in the handbook, I said that it would be the drug dealer who is seen to be doing well within the environment that they're in. So he seemed to be working that reality better than they are. So this is the this is where they want to go with it. These, these are the people they, or it's some cartoonish people from Fast and Furious or something like that. You know, they become car thieves and they think they can drive around really fast. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this way was missing. And then I suddenly realized that many, many of the adults that I was speaking to were also rudderless. They were just drifting. They didn't really have a, 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 a code of morals, a code of conduct. So I started thinking, well, when I initially started up with the booklet, I was looking at like stoicism, I was looking at different things, but I like things, I like the KISS philosophy, you know, keep it simple, stupid. I like this KISS philosophy where things can be easily recalled and easily used. And then when I started looking at the, the code of Bushido, I started looking at it and I started thinking, you know, this is really good. 
This is really simple and it, and, and it can work, particularly if you teach them how to look at reflecting on action, mm. which can lead to reflecting in action. So if you have a temper tantrum, afterwards you look at it and you think, for example, uh, that was not very benevolent of me. That was not very kind of me to, to, to do that. And then next time you feel that temper coming, you stop it in action. So it's moving it from reflecting in on action to reflecting in action, which I cover in the book as well, yeah. about how you can bookend your meditation around yeah. things that you've done during the daytime and using the virtues as a way of guiding you through life. Yeah. And that's basically how it came about. And it just developed and developed. And then after a while, I realized that I was developing it with none of my personality. And I was basically just developing and that's when, it, as I said to you, that's why there's a lot of directive stuff in it. When people yeah. say, as a hijack word, when we look at respect, and they say, you must respect me. Yeah. And I go, and, no, I don't. Because the antecedents of the word respect means to look back, yeah. which brings it at a particle of time. So I can respect somebody that collects stamps if they've done it for 20 years. I can respect that person. I could... I, I don't know why they're doing it. I have no <laughs> idea why they're collecting stamps. <laughs> anyway, they don't know why I punch people. Right? But I can, I can fully justify it. I will be tolerant, considerate, and kind yeah. in my interaction with you, which is more than most people are when they're having respect. Yeah. You know, tolerant, considerate, and kind. But to respect you, I've got to know that what you do is not a fad. It's not something that you're just like a bee floating from one to another. Yeah. And that's a lot of the problem that the youth of today have. Yeah. They, they, you know, they have this. Um, do you remember when you was a kid, when you went in to spend your money in a sweetie shop, you might have four bars of chocolate to choose from, right? And yeah. you go, ooh, I'll have that one, right? Yeah. As you got older, you go in, and there's like 20 bars of chocolate, and you don't know which one to go for. I know, that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> The thing for young people, they go onto YouTube and they're looking at people in YouTube and they, yeah. they want to be like this person. Exactly. And so much of it is centered around the body, the, the body beautiful in interaction. Mm. So if you fall short in this, then this lowers your self-esteem. Mm. But if you have a set of standards of morals that you can work through and you have these virtues to work through, it just makes, not only make you a better pe person, but people want to be with you. Who doesn't yeah. want to be with somebody that's loyal and honest, has a code of honesty, is courageous, is benevolent, has rectitude, has courage? Yeah. Who yeah. doesn't want to be with somebody like that? Everybody does. Yeah. And by making a simple, remember I said to you, I call it a manual. Yeah. Because when you buy a washing machine, you have a manual of how it works. You don't have the history of washing machines built into it. Yeah. Okay. That's right. so, yeah. so the whole thing developed. I then got quite territorial with it and went, I'm going to write it the way I want it. Yeah. <laughs> and I felt it was like a little sliver of myself. Yeah. I, I sent it to uh, Pancho Eric. He, he, he read through. He supplied some of the stories because I think it's always very good to supply stories. And that means that if you decide to take it to your club, you can have your own stories. Yeah. Not yeah. my stories, but your own yeah. stories to add in, to punctuate a point, to make a point, you know? So... He said, it's terrific. I, I, I took his stories and I just made them mine. I just retyped them a little bit and stuff like this. Put it out, got it developed. And I must be honest, so far, so far, <laughs> so far, yeah. he said, you're looking for something wooden to touch me, don't you? I've, I've had a lot of people really like him, really like him. They really like the book. Well, it's, I think that, you know, just it resonated with me on a number of elements. And, you know, maybe we should do... Um, something just on the book a bit later, you know, um, after it's gone to, a, you know, it's gone around the world to all of the IBK and and then other people get to, to read it as well. Um, but I, I really did, I really did like the way that, you know, you used, um, you know, the stories that weren't yours, you know, and I look forward to kind of hearing those things in the future as well. Um, more stories, because he, he seems to have obviously a lot of experience and like yourself. Um, so, I, I, I thought that the code that you brought together, because you made no false claims either in the book. So it was, you know, you'd made like a statement to say that <clears throat> there's lots of things that you can find on Bushido. There's lots of things that you can do and bring together. But it was very, very much a reference point um, for anybody that's coming to martial arts. Like you said, they're, they're kind of ships um, just floating because 
I think the same is with the kids that come in. They're, they're just looking for a place where, let's face it, Budo and Bushido, you could put that on a T-shirt and that's the tap out T-shirt from maybe a, a few years back, you know? And it's just that kind of, I do this. So, you know, it's a, you could have a sign on your door saying, beware of the dog, right? Because yes. being part of this club keeps people away from me. And that feeling of safety in that, that's why, you know, we, we make jokes, you know, I've put on weights in the last sort of 10 years and my belt is slowly getting smaller. And I said, if I keep going at this rate, it'll be I'll a wash problem. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> washing it. That's the problem. That's right. But, you know, I think that we, but the difference is where I take that uh, comfort is I know the path. I know how to do that. And I can jump back on that. I have that skill to do that. And at any point, whereas in when you're lost, you're looking for something like your book because it, you know, it, it very much it inspires the person, but brings together all of this jargon, if you like, that is being thrown around. I think it's going to, you know, so hopefully you're going to get this book everywhere and then people will know what, what I'm talking about. But you know, <laughs> I think personally, you know, I'll be using this book as a way of bringing people in because you know, you know, it's like when you've been doing this a long time, you tend to teach to the black belt standard and everybody else has got to catch up because you've done your time of bringing on all the beginners and the white belts and stuff. And then everybody else is going, what the hell do they mean by that? But then just go along with it, don't they? So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a real gift, I think. But I, I, well, another thing, it's another gift of that. And I think this is reflected in your book because if it was like an inch thick, you know, I would have been thinking, right, I need to set a lot of time away to read that. You know, I managed to get that book down and, and get it read as soon as, as soon as I could. You know, and I think it was the same day I think I'd ever read it. So um, I thought that was very much like your character. You know, you're very uh, a straight shooter and say it is what it is. Now, I think that's a real skill <laughs> because, you know, if, if you tell people what you think, and it might be the fact from your point of view, it doesn't mean that they're not going to take it or receive it badly. You know, so what, what's kind of been your... Your secret has is it, is it got you in a lot of trouble speaking your mind or along the way? Oh, yeah, or, yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah, but how yeah. do you get past that? Because you know, there's, there's a few care. characters out there. <laughs> You're still there. <laughs> I, I have. Uh, people said to me one time, you know, everyone's going on about being offended, being offended. Yeah. And I said to somebody one time, they said something to me at my work. They said, Oh, no offense. And I said, You're incapable of offending me. You're incapable <laughs> of it. And they said, why? I said, there are a handful of people who I love and I trust. Now, these people can offend me, but they don't offend me. If they said something that was offensive, it would hurt me, yeah. which is not offense. It's a very different thing. I says, you cannot hurt, you cannot offend me. I don't particularly care what you're saying, right? I don't place myself on any kind of, I objectify myself with most things apart from these, these, these group of, family and those I class as family. Yeah. They have that ability to offend me. They have that ability to hurt me. Everybody else, I don't care. And sometimes you need to, and I'm thinking of another one time when I turned around and some, I think it was Todd said to me, did you realize what you said to him? And I went, no, what did I say? Sometimes I do talk and I don't remember what I said. <laughs> and I said, no. As you turned around to a seventh man and turned around and says, you're not worth that, you're not worth that belt. Because he yeah. couldn't fight, he could, he could, Kyokushin fight, yeah. but he couldn't fight fight. Right. And one of the problems I have, which is why I love Kudo so much, you know, and Goshin so much, is right. We, I spoke about this in the thing I was telling you. Imagine how fucking raged up you are when you become a black belt. You're in the front of the class. You can do this. And you go out, and I use this all the time. So fat. Pizza eating, sandal wearing, PS4 playing, twat smacks you in the face with one of these ones like this, and you collapse. The double whammy of A being beaten by somebody and B being beaten because you're a black belt, right? Yeah. Goshen, in my opinion, needs to be part of every black belt grading. You need to see if your guys can handle, and girls, I'm saying guys as a generic one, your yeah, guys and cool. girls can handle themselves in a terror. If they can't handle themselves in a terror, just go and do origami or something. Yeah. You know, go and do something else. Go and do stretch aerobics or something. I don't care, right? <laughs> You're coming to martial arts because it's a martial art. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not boxer, boxer size. 
No, I mean, no, I, no. I get wound up with boxer size. You go in and people are taking their hands up. <laughs> what are you doing? You went to do 15 rounds of sparring. We're hitting a heavy bag. No, I'm just going to do some pad work. But, but for these people, it's about the... It's about the gloves and the wraps. It's it's about the ritual of doing this stuff yeah. as opposed to actually fighting. But for myself personally, if you're doing a martial art, you need to be able to have a tear up. You need to be able to handle yourself. It's not saying you can't lose, of course. No. But at least lose with a little bit of dignity. At least lose throwing some back at me. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the, when I met John Blooming, that's what he was like. And the first time I met him and he was speaking, and I just remember thinking, where has this guy been? There was no bullshit about the man. Not an ounce of bullshit about the man. Yeah. You know? Oh, but what yeah. if this, this, and this? Uh, take him to the ground, rip his arms off. Let's see how he fights then. You yeah. know? Uh, he, he, there was no, there was nothing about him that was like, you know, everything was about, it's got to work, it's got to work. You know? Yeah. And that, yeah. that was what impressed me. I didn't get any of this kind of quasi-Japanese bullshit. Yeah. yeah, kind of lionizing and idolizing kind of stuff, you know. Yeah. We, you know, I remember a few years ago, I got invited. I'm not going to say too much. But I got it is in Aberdeen, and these neo generation of Shotokan black belts had turned up. Neo generation, new generation. Yeah, and at this club, and it was a big event. I got asked to have a watch. I was doing Ashihara at the time, so I had my kanji on. This lad was fighting one of the Scottish guys, and the Scottish guy was all over this guy, all over him, touching him, spinning spinning back, kick, really, but, but not, not taking the piss, just all over him, you know? Then as he threw a kick, this Japanese guy kicked him straight in the groin, straight in the plums, as his leg was up, boom, straight in the plums, right? Boy collapses to the floor, gagging. It was a hell of a hit. The instructor I was, who brought the guys over, turns to his, I was stood behind him. He didn't know I was stood behind him. He turned around and he said, they all spoke very good English, these Japanese, you know, and said to the, his instructor, do you see how he stopped him? Do you see how he stopped him? Beautiful, he was, oh, he was all over, he just did this and stopped him. And I leant forward and I said, Mr. X, <laughs> reverse it. The Japanese instructor had been all over your boy and then your boy kicks him in the plums. I says, I know for a fact you'd be raging, absolutely raging at your boy. So you're giving this, this, this because he's from the Hongo dojo of, of the mm. system they did, you know, yeah. you're giving him a pass. And I thought, no, I'm not having this. So he, the, the, the Japanese guy had pulled his gi and went anti-clockwise around the hall. I thought, I'm having you. So I went clockwise around the hall, right? And we met and I said to him, will you try that shit with me? Like that. And, just he just didn't want to know. And can you believe it? They threw me out. Really? <laughs> they threw me out. They came across and said, "It's time for you to leave." <laughs> yeah, but no, but yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, give it a try. Let's see what a few low kicks and a couple of punches in the face yield on this. You know, because yeah. that was that was bad Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's bad Buddha. Yeah, it's put it in there. But do, don't you think that, like, the rule sets, I mean, like, this this journey, I mean, you mentioned the, the Brist, Bristol Death Squad, you know, because that was, the, for me, it was a turning point um, in uh, the traditional karate for life that everybody's fighting orthodox, and then all of a sudden the Laoga guys come in and they're fighting southpaw, side on, no one knows what to do, and everybody's getting knocked out with sight with, with uh, axe yeah. kicks collarbones breaking, people being stretched off. It was just like the world exploded, right? And then it, it just it just it seemed that never stopped, you know. Then you know Kyokushima using legs, but then Thai boxing came on board and then heads and legs and then elbows and so on. And then you know for me personally I found myself in Kudo because it was just less rule, less rule, less rules. And like we said, getting kicked in the plums. Now um you know it just obviously we've just lost uh Juku Choke from uh from Kudo, so it's obviously at a time now of, of loss and grief for, across the world. And I mean, my, this is my uh, new T-shirt for the for the club because that's the Daido Juku Kudo. Uh, Kudo is not the the kanji we wear in our gi, but this is what, how yeah. we started out. And uh, and I think this is really applicable to this this conversation. Really, is that um, there was always this balance when it came to the the fighting, and. You know, it was like, so, uh, like I said, Fabrice, in his grade, in his third down in Malta, 
uh, there was a massive size difference in the things. And we, in, when there's that in CUDA, we can kick to the plums. You know, it's uh, that's that's fair. That's a fair fair rule. So you know, it helps with that advantage because you can't kiss someone's head is up there, but you can kick them once you've kicked them in the plums, or you can knee them in the head right when they drop a bit. So yeah. it's, it makes it very 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 um, balanced. But I think the bit that that um, is tribute to to um, uh, uh, Master Zuma was that he was always really about the lifelong learning, you know, and that and the balanced part to it was. Uh, for me, the reason that it that it brought me in because he was really an investor of people, and that's something that I see in yourself. Where, like, when you work with kids for so long, it just becomes naturally part of what you do, doesn't it? And yeah. the Gogjin part of it for the club for me was always about giving these kids uh, or young people or whatever the term that you wanted to use life skills to deal with bullies, not just. And I suppose I'm moving on to the kind of Jeff Thompson type characters and the. You know the BCKA that that actually talked about the verbal skills, and you know where where Kudo gets said, well, yeah, you you know you're like an MMA in a gi, um, but in real situation you wouldn't have a face plate. In a real situation you wouldn't do that. I think as a sport, it's as far as you can get, as close as you can with the sport without taking obviously into account gloves, face masks, whatever. Um, but you know I, the one thing that come across me with you is that. You know that that's something you really believe in, right? It's about the, the holistic picture of self-defense, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think we need to give people more than just the physical skills, yeah. because the body is finite. The body—it's so easy to get. In fact, I, I tell a story um, in the uh, in the Budo uh, handbook about when I was in Bristol and I was training at a club, and there was a very charismatic young man who was like a really good. Um, Wado Kumite fighter, and he wanted to do more and more, but the old instructor wanted to stay at it, and they split, right? And I was kind of ping pong between the two, but the old instructor had this very quiet dignity about him. It's lovely dignitas, you know, about him, this dignity about him, you know? And um, uh, I said, I feel guilty. I oh, just keep training. But the lad, I, I ended up going to Shetland, so I didn't know what happened, but eventually I found out that the lad had damaged his knee. Right. and that laid him up for months and months and months and then when he came back he wasn't the same guy and the whole club collapsed yeah. because he, he only had one thing yeah. the problem with a lot of these clubs is a lot of them only have the one thing which is the physical not just the fighting but the physical yeah, yeah totally so where is your philosophy where is a life philosophy that is tied in with the martial arts that everybody knows about but perhaps doesn't really explore mm -hmm. you know and I mean I didn't do any historical stuff with it I just looked at at the, at the virtues themselves. And that's the other bit, the holistic bit that comes in, where people can actually take something. So if you run a kid's class, 45 minutes of hard training, 50 minutes of saying, right, tell me what you know about respect. What do you think respect means? What do you think it means from this? So you can you can take the, the every week, you can look at one of them, and that gives you seven weeks. And yeah. after seven weeks, on week eight, you go back to number one again. Yeah. And you work your way through getting young people to talk about it, yeah. to explore the options and the topics. Yeah. So by the time they're they're eleven, by the time they're sixteen, they, these things are in their heads. Yeah, yeah. These are Definitely. firmly launched in their heads, and they have a life philosophy that is neither religious; it's just a secular philosophy that adds on to yeah. whatever they're doing. And um, uh, and uh, like I said, I, I just think it's. I, I think the virtues themselves are terrific. Maybe not my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, I'm going to be pushing that. As soon as you obviously can get enough copies to be able to get around the place, then um, we're going to do that. But um, so let, let's 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 focus on um, uh, Kaicho John Blooming then. So, you know, what what sort of impacts? And like, because I've heard different things um, from different people. Obviously, there's been a connection um, between Kaicho John Blooming and um, Azuma uh, at the uh, Honbu and uh, Masayama. Um, there's there's some that said that he he wasn't a very good striker because he was more judo. And then you've got other people saying different things. But the holistic picture means that you don't have to be brilliant at everything. But he was highly ranked and out taught at the Honbu. And then after the obviously Masayama passed, there was this um, fraction obviously with within the association which obviously you'd expect to see next and the but he he released this video um which i've seen a while back now i was going to try to re-watch it before we had this interview but i remember him um showing books about things the way the japanese like to romanticize things 
um, or, or put things in text. He's speaking to Graham Noble. I think so. Yeah, it's it's uh, basically where he debunks a lot of the stuff, it's, isn't it's, it? It's the one I. It's my video. I was sat off camera. No way. It's my video. So, no. Yes. Yeah, it's wow. mine. That's so I, so I can't really ask you if you believe in our video then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, my, it's my video. Yeah, yeah. So how so did that? I mean, that video. I've seen some. Um, obviously, if you're following uh, a style or a you know a martial art, and then somebody says, "Well, actually, you didn't really take on a bull. It was more like a like a baby," or or these sorts of things. But it, 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 the way I look at it, because I'm an outsider, it came across very respectful because you could see he had a lot of respect for yeah. a Masayama. Um, so what was your take on, on all of that? Because obviously, you, you know, in the association, you're... He, he um, I mean, he, abs he, he called Oyama the old man. He right. says, oh, the old man. So I love the old man. I mean, and he genuinely did love him. Every time he spoke about him, it was with like a deep love and a, and a reverence. I never heard him. He would be honest. I would say to him, I remember, I remember um, uh, the, the, the lad that's just talking with him is Graham Noble. Right. I don't know if you know about Graham Noble. No. Graham Noble, I don't even, I tried calling him a year or so ago because I knew, knew Graham and I knew his mum. And I couldn't seem to get through. And I'm really kind of hoping that everything is okay with him. But if, if you want to type in Graham Noble Oyama in America, right. that's an extraordinary one where he actually interviewed the wrestlers in America where Oyama was with them. You know, and he, he asked them things like, did he fight all these boxers and all the rest of it? And they're very diplomatic in their answers, going like, well, he might have, but I didn't see it. <laughs> you know, but he learned this kind of his, his uh, breaking, he learned that he had, he had this, he had a presence about him. Mm. And he was much loved amongst the, the wrestling people that he was with. He, he really, they, they really did like him. Mm. But if you go into um, Google, type in Google Books, yeah. and it'll come up, type in Black Belt Magazine. Okay, click that, it'll come down, and then you get to search within Black Belt Magazine and type in Oyama. You have them as far back as 1963. Oh, wow. Where he's trying to get all the styles together as one karate style, okay. where he's doing it. But there's no mention of his 100 man fight or his 300 man fight. There's no mention of that, nothing. Right? right? right. You know, and like John said he was. Um, Really took care of John. If John didn't have money, he looked after him. John went to his house. He knew his wife well. Um, uh, him and Draga would often, you know, because him and Don F. Draga were like the best of chums. They chummed around everywhere. They lived at the house together, the famous house. You know, they were all there together. And I never heard him. Um, in fact, I remember one time, I think it was Fujihara. They were talking about, uh, um, because um, Oyama had a fourth down in judo, I think. Yeah. He was he actually done yeah, judo as well. I think so. I think I might be wrong on that, but I, I know he was black belt ranked in judo. Yeah. And Oyama was talking about uh, uh, Blooming, John Blooming, uh, Kaicho was talking about how we should combine all, all in fighting, which eventually became the all round fighting. Yeah. And I think it was uh, Fuji, either Fujihara or Fujiwara. One of them said, like, I don't know. So John leapt on him. And John's really honest. He said, ah, It wasn't much of a fight. I'm 120 kilos. He's about 60. But he tied him up like with his with his belt. So he's actually tied him up with the belt. He says, I'm swinging him. He says, I look up. And he says, and the old man's staring at me through the door. He says, oh, he says, my blood went cold. You know, so, he, you know, he had this kind of, um, he had this deep love for him. He really did. But he wouldn't buy into anything he saw as bullshit. Right, yeah. Well, First time Bill and Bill Baracus, I think it was, uh, um, uh, Oyama said to him, come with me, I want to show you a film, and showed him the film with the bull, yeah. and they both says, never show this, never show this, maybe in Japan show it, but never show it to the Westerns, never show it, it just, he says it wasn't a bull, it was an ox, Right. family has an ox, he said it was an ox, and he's mm -hmm. quite clear, he writes about this stuff, he's very clear about it, you know, but as for his, his love for Oyama was never diminished. And Cameron Quinn was saying that he was there when Oyama, when uh, Blooming came across to speak to Oyama's wife after Oyama died. Yeah. He said Blooming was howling, he was crying. Yeah. When they met together for the first, for the, since they hadn't seen each other for years. 
Yeah. You know, because um, they split up when Luke Hollander, I think, came in right. to go over okay. in Holland. But you've got to remember, he was a sixth man in 1965. Wow. John Blooming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But always absolute total respect for Oyama. Just yeah. the whole time. Pictures of him up on his walls in his house. Yeah. Everything. I mean, the way I look at it is if somebody knows somebody that well, and then they speak, and they speak from the heart. You have to respect that. It's like, I mean, there's so many, because obviously Kyokushin is such a big thing around the world, and people get very defensive, and obviously you understand defensive behavior, so you can understand why people get like that. You know, it's it's almost like an attack on them, isn't it? So it's, but it, but I found that, I found in that, um, when he was talking about the, the, the makiwara, and the, the blister knuckles, and or all of that sort of thing, because the way I look at that, there, there was nothing in it that was could you know questionable as far as I was concerned. But and how can you question someone like that? So what I mean, what's your what was your relationship like with John Blooming? With John Blooming, yeah. I just, I loved him, absolutely adored the man, absolutely adored the man. It just I I, um, I, I, I we recently did a thing on uh, about like the first time our first kind of proper memories with him. So the first time I met him, he's about my age now. Nice. I'm a young man in my 40s, and my wrestling was like good. My wrestling was really good. So he said to me, Oh, yeah, yeah, well, come and have a little go. And again, I did that. I'll be good to the old man. I, <laughs> I'll maybe just bridge out of this, just show you how good I am. But just a little bit of showing off so he'll know how good I am. I gotta, I gotta stop you there because. Todd said a very similar story about you. <laughs> he said he was going to take it easy on you. So I'm just letting you know that that, that wheel has come full circle now. <laughs> so, so uh, and uh, oh my God, he just destroyed me on the floor. You know, he just did. He turned my limbs into balloon animals. <laughs> just, every time I thought I had a, an opening that I could take a bridge, because obviously wrestling is a little different from the judo. We tend to take yeah. different back balls out things. And every time I thought I had an opening, he just, he literally would just roll his body. That's all, he just seemed to do a slight movement. And I remember coming out of it like sweating. I mean, like absolutely dripping with sweat and just thinking, well, that was just brilliant. That was just brilliant. How on earth did he do that? How on earth? And then you realize how, how long he's been doing for all his life. Yeah. And some of the greats that he trained with, you know? Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm nothing but a little fly on the wall. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that he just he literally could have even held him down with one hand, you know. But um, yeah, humbling, but actually coming away and thinking, yeah, I have met somebody I'd follow through the gates of hell. Yeah, well, I mean that's that. I mean that was leads me lovely into the the last question I was going to ask you is that, well, like I mentioned that, um, Azuma Takashi uh, Jugo Cho is is obviously just passed um, in this week and. You know, I saw a post where uh, David, I'm not sure if it's, do you say Yonkers or Jonkers? I don't, I don't know, I think it's, I think. Yeah, they pronounce the J's as Y, it's Yonkers. Yes, yeah, so it's Yonkers. Yonkers they, um, and obviously I, I had um, this year from meeting lots of people online, and I added him and I was like really quite liking the stuff that, that he does. And then there was a photograph of him, um, Azuma and uh, uh, Kaito Bloom and, and David, David's um, Soak David Cook, um, and they're they're all in a in a group now. I mean, you said obviously that you were um, the age, and this, you know, you're getting to that point now. How how does that make you feel? Look like you know, because there's there's only out of that photograph, there, there's only David Yonkers left, you know, um, and they were pioneers in their own right, weren't they? So I'm just wondering, you know, what what what's part? What what's your um, or what do you want to do, I guess, with with your time now within uh, with John Bloom's work? You know, it's really quite simple. Now, my my job is to support Cancho Eric right. and to make the IBK. Um, uh, uh, Kaicho ran it pretty much on his own and left everybody to do their own kind of thing, which worked in some areas and didn't work in other areas. Okay. You know, it, you know it, it did work with some, and it did end up with terrific things like one country might be more so like K1 orientated than groundwork, and one country might be more groundwork than K1 orientated, which would lead to terrific fights 
yeah. when they, you know, when they would meet terrific fights, you know, look really good. So that kind of stuff worked in its way. But then you'd find out that perhaps the K1 kind of country was not investing really as much as it should do in the groundwork and, and vice versa. Right. So what Tancho Eric is attempting to do is he's attempting to lift things up to a more kind of through, not through saying you're wrong, we're right, but just yeah. simply saying, how can we help you move on? How can we help this yeah. come through? So for myself, I see myself enabling and helping and doing things like writing this, the, the Budo um, book, yeah. uh, taking that further in some areas. We want to, on summer camps, and uh, introduce lessons in it, like a classroom yeah. lessons. Great, great, yeah, great. So we can sit and people can actually discuss points and raise points and, and what about this and how can we work with this, um, um, but also to cement that home to the, to the instructors. Yeah. Um, the, we're bringing Goshen in as part of the black belt ratings now. There has to be a kind of Goshen test. Um, Tom Madsden, who's also one of the special advisors, is a terrific Krav Maga guy. So he's also got a lot of experience in that kind of stuff as well. So we're, we're, we're going to be bringing that in. So not only do we have the guys that will do their 30, 40, and 50 man fights, and they're yeah. all round fighting fights, they're not just all knockdown, they have to be yeah. all round fighting. Yeah. Um, then um, at the end of it, there'll also be some kind of like real proper street brawl self-defense stuff mm -hmm. um, that, we'll be, that we'll be bringing in as well. So for myself, um, it's working with Eric to try and make the IBK the best that we can do for Kaicho. Right. When, um, when uh, Kaicho died on the 17th December 2018, um, uh, when we went to his funeral, it was with, with Yandi Brun, who runs a Kyokushin section of, yeah. of the, there's two separates, all around fighting and the Kyokushin. So there was myself, um, Eric, and Tom Madsden. And Kancho had had a couple of strokes prior to um, getting gangrene in his foot and having to have part of his foot amputated, which his body then struggled with, you know, because he was older and to recover from that. Um, but he was smart enough, um, unlike a lot of these people who suddenly either die or think they're going to carry on forever, yeah. he set in motion a, 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 his own, you know, Eric at the top, the two special advisors to, to yeah. run the, the, uh, his panel kind of idea. So he managed, he got that in place. So we knew where we were going to be going. And when um, this was a really touching, touching moment. We were invited, um, Albertine uh, Kaicho's wife invited us to go to the private section after the funeral. So we went, were in with the coffin with Kaicho with Yandi Brun. And Yandi, Yandi Brun is terrific. He's very much, he's a military man. He's, he's, I, I like Yan a lot. He's a really, really, really good guy. And what he did was he, we all put our hands on the coffin where Kaicho's heart would be and he made, he didn't make us, it wasn't a threat. <laughs> we all swore that we would try and make the IBK the best that we could be for Kaicho. So we took almost like an oath on the, like I'm saying, it sounds very dramatic, right? But we actually took an oath on the dead body of Kaicho that we would work to try and make the IBK. And if you love somebody and you admire them, then that's all you need. That's, you don't, you don't, you need no more motivation. Yeah. If Cantor says to me, Cantor Eric says, we need to do something here. I go out and I do it. Mm. You know, I go out and I do it, you know, so um, there's not very, hardly anybody knows that story, actually. That's going to go well. <laughs> very, very few people know that story. So with myself, Tom Mazden, Cantor <laughs> Eric, uh, Yandy Brun. Uh, so that's where we made our promise. And that's why we pushed so hard with it. That's why you push so hard. That's that's an amazing story, and obviously you can, like I think what you said about the motivational element to to, um, what more do you need than than that? That is that's very powerful. Yeah. Um, the so oh, I don't know how to follow on that one. <laughs> so that's, thinking about one because I've known Dave since nineteen ninety one. Yeah. So I've known Dave for uh, many many years. Um, uh, and he has done an absolute terrific job with the ICO, the Ashihara International Cry Organization. Yeah. He's done an absolutely terrific job with that. And that is like moving from strength to strength. Yeah. And it, it's, he used to be Sam Schilt's coach. 
for the, I think it was called Golden Glory, I think it was, I think they were Golden Glory team, um, and did a terrific job with that. Unfortunately, they're not together anymore. I don't right. know why, they're just not together anymore. Yeah. But um, um, I got to see him for the first time in uh, nine, 19 years or something, you know? Mm. And he just sneaked up and swept both my legs off my feet. <laughs> didn't see it coming. I remember brake falling and he leapt on top of me and I just remember thinking, Oh, this is just brilliant. This is just, this is just brilliant. You know, and um, I genuinely enjoy being in this company. It's because I've also known him. We went through the Ashihara together. We were at Scalamari on, on Fastos, developing the... Um, we went to Greece, to the island of Fassos, to a small village called Scalamarion, where we right. hired a little school, yeah. a tiny little school, uh, as myself with Dave Yonkers, Yuma Glasson was there. There was a few of the guys there, Spion Larson was there. And I'm missing guys out, so apologies to the guys out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. um, and we went there and developed the, um, the ICO syllabus. You know, at that time, it's, 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 it, um, Dave never sits still, he's moved it on yet again, you know. Uh, and it was terrific. It was just a fantastic week being there. Um, and it was Steve Cook's 50th birthday because he suddenly appeared in Speedos. <laughs> oh, great. Veggie <laughs> <laughs> smugglers. Veggie smugglers. Yeah. Yeah, he's, 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 uh, he says, it's me, but we didn't know when it's my birthday. I'm going to the beach. We're all like, <laughs> okay. <then. laughs> and I remember it's his 50th birthday when we was at Scalamari. Yeah, I remember that. You know? well, so, the, 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 the last part I wanted to ask you really was um, a little bit of advice, I guess, is that uh, the one thing that obviously being from uh, different style, different styles, if you like, of curry, um, but being now kudo, um, you know, I've never had that feeling. It's like when you meet someone that's from a different association, it's so, oh, but we do it this way. You know, it's, I've never had that conversation as long as I've known you. Um, there's, there's obviously people out there that are trying to unify um uh, it's the, the age old trying to bring all the people together um you know wh and i wish them all the best as well you know it's like chris hansen one guy i've met this this year as well you know he's doing really well of trying to bring networks together but you know that i think going back to your book your book was was actually um putting characteristics or, or strategies behind how to become a person that is able to communicate with other people with similar on a similar path um whereas in i find that those that are hanging on the styles are looking you know i suppose i'm just i'll, I'll just say it right the people that, that hang on to the style i see in the style and not putting that investment in themselves as a person because the style doesn't reflect does it it's it's you as a person and as a martial mm -hmm. artist so what would your advice be you know to to anybody that's kind of stuck in an organization and, and for anybody watching this, this is not um, a way for, for um, Hanshi to plug the IBK. This is a general, yeah, a genuine um, reflection. How, how do you become a better martial artist and not be hindered by styles? I think the only thing to do is to try different things. You have to, it, life is multifaceted. It's not a flat plane of glass, you know, and you need to touch all these different points. And the thing to remember is that um, as well as touching all these kind of different points, it has to be something that resonates with your psyche. So I, I, I'm quite happily, because I was raised in violence, I, I'm actually, I'm quite happily with violence is going on around me when I ran nightclubs and there was big fights and stuff like that. It didn't resonate the same way as maybe, and I'm thinking of a particular doorman that ended up like completely shaking. You know, he was not fit for the task. Um, he wants to chat up girls and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but <laughs> so, so some people are drawn. So see, um, martial arts is, is hugely, it's a hugely complex system. Some people will do Tai Chi and they're perfectly happy just doing Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. If people are stuck in a system and they're happy being stuck in a system, there's no point moving them on. If they say to you, I think there's more out there, but I feel stuck in this system. That's already taking the first step. Yeah. So what you need to do as a fellow martial artist is facilitate their next steps. They say, and by getting them to look at what it is they think they need. Yeah. So what is it about this system that you're not enjoying? 
you know? Oh, we just go up and down, punching, punching. So it might not be the system, it might be the instructor. Right, okay, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. let's take you to a Shotokan club where these boys are cowboy crazy. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> they will, you know, and they whack pads and they whack each other and they, it's like the old JKA of the 50s and 60s, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's take you there and let's see if that resonates with you. Um, no, I didn't. I'd like to do a little bit more. Okay, is, is it still Japanese karate you want to do? Let's try and let's take you to Kyokushin or Ashihara or Kudo. Let's try you along these things. Oh no, that's too violent. Well, let's move you back out to this. It's about figuring out what they want and if their personality is capable of delivering on that system. Yeah. A lot of people love the idea of being MMA fighters. How many people actually do it? As Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan till you punched in the face. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right? so, true, so, so it's, true. It's, it's not as simple as saying uh, this or this. It, it might be that the style is, is good, but the instructor is not good for them. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying the instructor is bad. I'm just saying the instructor is not good for them. So take them to a similar system that you know is almost polar opposite of how they train and just say, why don't you try this from here? And see how you get on with that. I know. And then if they say, so I still know what I want, and say, what do you want? I want it a bit more realistic. Realistic, how? Punch in the face realistic, or Goshen realistic, yeah. or Kudo realistic, yeah. or, yeah. or I'm fighting realistic. What are you looking for? You want a bit of groundwork thrown in? Do you not want to? Oh, I don't know. Well, what? Go. So, so you, when you, the problem is, is if they go to somebody that is as limited as themselves with their knowledge. Right, yeah. So, yeah. so it'll be like Pong. It'll be <laughs> bank, bank, it'll bounce between them. What yeah. you want to do is remove the two barriers so they ping off on their own. Yeah. yeah. They can move away on their own. So is it the system or is it the instructor? And then find out by fine tuning and questioning and causing them to reflect on what they're doing. Yeah. You know, what is it that you're really after? What is it that you're looking for? Because it might be some pie in the uh, pie in the sky. I want to be an MMA fighter. Yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> you know, well, I want to fight I, in the UFC. You don't have the tools for it, son. You don't have these tools. <laughs> no. <laughs> like this, um, it's that is great advice. Um, I hope people will take that on board. And um, you know, for anybody that hasn't met Mark, uh, Mark's go. Hopefully, when the circuit uh, is open again, he'll be back on the circuit internationally. Um, but before we go, Mark, I just want you to say that pizza eating statement again because I, I love it and I have it. Pizza, <laughs> so pizza don't be a don't be a pizza a fat pizza eating sandal wearing PS PS4 playing fat <laughs> fat twat, twat. fat uh, twat. <laughs> the face, yes. <laughs> Sandal wearing, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. That, came from, that came out in a class one time. I just, I, I, I was getting really angry with everybody because they were dithering, and I, I ended up seething with anger, and I just let rip <laughs> And I found it so amusing that I thought I'd keep it in. No, I think the thing that that shows the bit that I find very difficult is when. Uh, people are sitting and in their positions in organization and, and not being not real as in as a person, but real to themselves. And I, I appreciate everything and every ounce of energy that you give um, to us down in Wales. And um, please continue uh, to do what you're doing and, yeah. um, and, and get that second book out, because I think a lot of people really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of ideas for a couple of books, but the second book, um, I will be contacting people for their own stories. So there'll be several yeah. stories within each one. Wow. So you'll be wow. getting an email. Have you made? <laughs> so you'll be getting an email. Thanks a lot, Hans. I want, I want a story. Okay. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.